back to Killer Stories. I'm your host, Bobby Holmes. I'm trying so hard to continue to bring you new content. As of right now, it seems like that is at best on a once a month basis. But we recently had to put down our Jack Russell Dexter. He was with us for 15 years. And if you're a pet owner, you know, they really are like family. Thank you for understanding that life is crazy and continuing to support me and the show. Before we get started, I wanted to ask a favor. It would be extremely helpful if you could take a moment and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or a rating on Spotify. It makes killer stories more visible to others looking for a good true crime fix. Research and partial writing for today's episode was done by Sarah Bro. You may have noticed I typically tell stories in chronological order, background on the victims and or perpetrators, how they were raised, and how their paths crossed. Well, today I'm going to do things a little bit differently. This story is more impactful starting at the end. November 15th, 2004. 52-year-old Peter Porco woke up and began his routine just like any other day. He walked into the bathroom and brushed his teeth. Then, he walked down the stairs and began emptying the dishwasher, starting to make himself some coffee. After this, Peter walked out his front door to grab the morning newspaper. He turned back and realized he had locked himself out. He hunched down and grabbed the spare key hidden under a rock. Peter unlocked the door, walked inside, and collapsed on the floor. Peter died right there in his entryway. Peter went about his routine, but was actually in a state of shock. He had been brutally beaten in the head with an axe. To be exact, he took 16 blows to the head. Missing part of his skull, as well as his lower jaw, Peter stood in front of the bathroom mirror and brushed his teeth as blood spilled into the sink, completely oblivious to his injuries. He made his way to the kitchen and then out the front door as a trail of blood followed. His body finally gave up, collapsing in the entryway of the home. Okay, that's your sneak peek. Now, who was Peter Porco and what the heck happened to him? Peter Raymond Porco was born on August 22, 1952 in Norwalk, Connecticut. Peter graduated from the University of Albany. While at the university, he met Joan Balzano, who was studying speech pathology. They married in June of 1974. He later graduated from Albany Law School and began working as an assistant public defender. He later moved on to work at a private law practice. Joan worked as a speech pathologist at Bethlehem Elementary School. Together, they had two boys, Jonathan and Christopher. Now that they had children, Peter wanted to spend more time at home. He left his position at a private firm and began working as a law clerk at the county courthouse. This position had more of a set schedule that allowed him to attend his son's activities and occasionally even put time in as a coach for their sports teams. Jonathan graduated from Bethlehem High School and joined the Navy. He was serving as a lieutenant on a nuclear sub hundreds of miles away at the time of the attack. Christopher was attending the University of Rochester, where he studied biomedical engineering and economics. The campus was approximately three hours away from Del Mar, where Peter and Joan lived. Back to where we started today's story. November 15th, 2004. Obviously, Peter didn't show up for work, which wasn't like him. He was always punctual, and if he were to be absent or late, he always let someone know. Out of concern, a co-worker came by his house to check on him. The court officer noticed that there were drops of blood on the front stoop. He checked the doorknob and it was unlocked. He opened the door and found Peter lying in a pool of blood right inside the entryway. He immediately dialed 911. Officers on the scene described how incredibly gruesome and bloody the crime scene was. Not only was there blood everywhere, but Peter had deep wounds on his head and face. After the local police force arrived to investigate the scene of the crime, Joan was found upstairs in the master bedroom. She was lying in bed, also covered in blood and suffering from severe head and facial injuries. 
The officer thought she too was deceased, but noticed that her hand moved. She was still alive. He instantly tried to communicate with her, but due to her injuries, she wasn't able to speak. However, she was able to answer questions by nodding her head yes or shaking her head no. Joan was immediately taken in an ambulance, but time was of the essence. They didn't know if she was going to survive. They took advantage of this opportunity to ask her some questions and try to get to the bottom of who was responsible for this heinous attack. The brutality of the crime indicated this was personal. They assumed someone close to the family committed these crimes. The officer asked Joan if a family member did this to her. She nodded. He asked if it was Jonathan. She shook her head no. So he then asked if Christopher did this to her. She slowly nodded her head. Yes, her son Christopher had attacked her and her husband Peter. While Joan was rushed to the hospital and into emergency surgery, a reporter for the Times Union called Chris Porco's room at the University of Rochester. This was around 2 p.m., and they were hoping to speak to his roommate about the Porco family. But Chris himself answered the phone, and the reporter informed him that his parents were found dead that morning. Chris then called the Bethlehem Police Department. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Porco. I was just called by the Times Union saying that my parents were found dead this afternoon. Um, I was wondering if you had any information on me. Hey, Chris, sorry, I'm, where about are you? I'm at school in Rochester, New York. Okay, you're at, in Rochester? Yes. Okay. Do you have a phone number there, Chris? Yeah, I sure do. Um, okay, and are, are you in a dorm there? Yes, I am. Okay, and you're hearing from the Times Union? Yeah, they called me and said my, my parents were found, um, I guess, that I don't know, they didn't say how or anything. When was the last thing you said you came down to see your parents? Uh, about three weeks ago. I, it was on the weekend. Um, I can't give you a day. I have to, I have to figure it out. I'm not really sure. Okay, but about three weeks ago? Yeah. Okay, and the email, what, what's going on with your email? You said you, um, you, you well, emailed him today, but you didn't get a, a response? But yeah, I, I emailed him this afternoon. Um, my dad at work. Okay. Um, about uh, college loan stuff. About what? College loan stuff. Oh, about college loans? Yeah. All right. Let me just... So you will be here probably... You're going to go right to Albany Med? Uh, I don't know. Where, where, I don't even know where my mom is, but... Yeah, she is at Albany Med. Okay. Do, do you know her condition? Uh, in... No, because I haven't talked to her. Let me give you my pager number. Now, I can be a bit dramatic, but I don't know a single person who would be this calm after hearing that their parents were killed. I've heard his demeanor during this call being compared to a person ordering takeout. No emotion whatsoever. I understand this news could put someone into a state of shock and you never know how you'll react until you're in that situation, but I find his reaction incredibly suspicious. Chris told police that he planned to meet with his uncle and they would drive to the hospital from Rochester together. Upon arriving, Chris was met by several officers who then escorted him to the station for questioning and impounded his yellow Jeep Wrangler for processing. This was due to the fact that Joan identified him as the one who attacked her and Peter. He was also asked to surrender the clothes he was wearing. Chris was very polite, but showed no emotion throughout the six-hour interrogation. He stated that he had not been at his parents' home for at least three weeks, and he had no idea why his mother would suggest otherwise. Chris said he had emailed his father earlier that day regarding school loans, but he hadn't gotten a response. He claims to have been in his dorm room that evening prior and fell asleep on a couch watching a movie. Because he fell asleep in the lounge, he had missed several calls from the police. His phone was left in his dorm room to charge. But this alibi failed to check out. Several of his fraternity brothers stated that they had been in the lounge until 3 a.m. and Chris was not with them. The room was relatively small and, as one witness stated, quote, It's not like he was there and we overlooked him. He was not there. Unquote. Police were able to track Chris's online activity. He was chatting with his girlfriend, Sarah Fisher, from his dorm room computer until 10 p.m. on November 14th. 
He then stated that he had to pick up an economics book. Curious where you're going to get a book at 10 p.m., but perhaps borrowing it from a classmate? If that's the case, no one has come forward to back up the story. She had no further messages from him until 2 p.m. on the 15th. From his dorm room computer, he told Sarah that he wasn't feeling well. While Sarah was chatting with Chris, she received a message from her younger sister. She told Sarah that something horrible happened at the Porco home. Upon hearing this, Chris stated that he, quote, hadn't heard from his parents all morning and he was nervous. Sarah went to her 2 p.m. class. She was finished around 3 p.m. and had a message from Chris that simply stated, my parents are dead. To clarify, his mother is still alive. She survived the attack, but rumors swirled about the crime and assumptions were made. Let's review evidence from the crime scene. No blood or other forensic evidence was found on the clothes Chris surrendered or inside his Jeep. No fingerprints were found on the murder weapon, which was an axe. At the time of the attack, a key was used to enter the home, and security system was deactivated using a master code. After the attack, someone cut the phone lines. The security company was able to pinpoint the exact time this was done. Now, if this was an outsider coming into the home, you would think that they would cut the lines prior to entering. This seemed more like an attempted cover-up. The defense team was trying to play this off as a robbery gone wrong. We hear this robbery gone wrong thing so often, and I'm sorry, but no one is breaking in to burglarize a home wielding an axe. Plus, they did a shitty job at covering their tracks. Joan's purse was untouched, her wallet still lying on the counter. Peter's wallet was on the bedroom dresser. Jewelry and electronics were left behind. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about Chris Porco. There was recent tension between Chris and his parents regarding money. There were documented emails back and forth between Chris and Peter regarding loans that were taken out to cover his tuition, but also for a new Jeep Wrangler that Chris had purchased. The truth was, Chris wasn't the greatest student. He was actually asked to leave Rochester University due to his poor grades. He left the university and attended a community college for the remainder of the year. The following school year, Chris reapplied to the University of Rochester and was accepted. But here's the kicker. He hadn't done so well at the community college either. And the only reason Chris was accepted back into Rochester was because he forged his transcripts. He had told his parents that the university was waiving his fall tuition because a professor had misplaced his final exam from the previous fall, which had resulted in his failing grade. That's not all. He also forged Peter's signature as a co-signer on the $31,000 school loan. And wouldn't you know it, Chris was routinely late at making payments towards the loan. So this affects not only Chris's credit, but Peter as the co-signer and he started receiving notices in the mail from Citibank. I'm not sure of the family dynamic, but it doesn't seem like Chris communicated much face-to-face or over the phone with his parents, at least not with these confrontational conversations. Peter emailed Chris asking him if he had forged his signature as a co-signer and what the hell did he think he was doing. He told Chris he was going to call Citibank and let them know he did not sign that paperwork. Chris was hit or miss at returning calls or even emails from his parents, but to this he did reply, telling his father not to worry. The payments weren't late, he had a payment schedule set up. But to avoid negative impact on Peter's credit, he paid the late fees and got the loan squared away. Peter sent another email to Chris that said if he ever abused his trust and forged his name again, he would not hesitate to file charges against him. He asked Chris to please come home so that they could talk about this some more. Even though Peter was laying down the law, as he should, he ended the email by saying he and Joan were disappointed in his actions but loved him and cared about his future. 
Chris was a pathological liar. He tried to elevate his social status at college and make it seem like he came from a very wealthy family, a maid, vacation home, etc. I'm surprised that the staged burglary was such a miss since Chris had actually burglarized his parents' home a few years prior. He tried to elevate his social status at college and make it seem like he came from a very wealthy family, a maid, vacation home, etc. From his parents' home, he took laptops, cameras, and other electronics, posting them on eBay. He used the money he made to supply his frat brothers with alcohol and buy clothing that made him look like the part of a spoiled rich kid. Chris collected the money from his sales on eBay, but never shipped out the items. When the sellers messaged about their items not arriving, Chris posed as his brother, Jonathan, saying that Chris had unfortunately passed away and was not able to send out the items. He continued to steal and list more items from his parents. He also broke into former employers' offices, stealing cameras, computers, etc. Others that lived in Chris's dorm noted missing laptops that were eventually found out to be stolen by Chris. Apparently, Chris was stupid enough to use his parents' eBay account. Really? <laughs> you didn't even create your own account. Peter began getting notifications regarding the sales going unfulfilled and froze the account. Chris's yellow Jeep Wrangler was a huge part of the investigation. He was easily identifiable. Chris liked to drive fast with music blaring, and it had oversized tires and some distinctive stickers. Although Chris stated that he hadn't left campus during the time of the attack, four cameras at the university recorded a yellow Jeep leaving the campus around 10.30 p.m. on November 14th. Around 10.45, Thruway toll collector John Fallon stated that he had a yellow Jeep Wrangler pass through his lane at the exit 46. He remembered that a white male in his early 20s with a baseball cap was the driver. Approximately three hours and 10 minutes later, the yellow Jeep was spotted at exit 24 by Albany toll collector Karen Russell. Russell remembered the Jeep because it approached the booth at a high speed just prior to her break at 2 a.m. You'd think he'd try to blend in as much as possible, but no, the entitled little shithead continued to drive like an asshole. A key was used to unlock the front door of the Porco home. The alarm was disarmed using a master code at 2.14 a.m. on November 15th. A neighbor of the Porcos, who was familiar with Chris and his Jeep, stated that he had seen it parked at the Porco driveway around 4 a.m. when he went to work. Video shows the same Jeep passing through the Henrietta exit 46 toll at 8.18 a.m. These times match up perfectly with the police timeline for Chris to have committed the crime. Although the plate number was not visible in the videos, experts were able to match the images to Chris's Jeep due to the distinctive sticker on the window, as well as a noticeable mud stain on one of the tires. The alarm panel was found to have been smashed, but this obviously took place after the code had been entered. The phone lines were cut sometime around 4.30 a.m., and the fact that the alarm panel was smashed and the lines were cut two hours after the alarm was disabled seems to fit with the police theory that Chris was trying to make the attack look more like a home invasion than a personal attack. Police believe that Chris had killed his parents in order to receive his share of their $1 million insurance policy. He and Jonathan were the beneficiaries and were both aware of that fact. Chris had also met with a financial advisor who he told he was going to be inheriting a large sum from a family member in the near future. Police felt that even though Peter and Joan seemed to be willing to help Chris out of his financial troubles, he was angry that they were confronting him about the poor choices and he decided to kill them rather than face up to what he had done. There was a lot of evidence piling up against Chris. His alibi didn't check out, video surveillance of his Jeep leaving and returning to campus that fits the timeline of the crime. 
But the most important piece of information was that Joan named Chris as her attacker. Here is where things get tricky. After three weeks in a medically induced coma, Joan awoke with no memory of the attack or her identification of Chris as the attacker. She wrote several letters to local newspapers pleading with the police to find the real killer and leave Chris alone. Maybe she truly believed he was innocent. I think it's more likely she wanted to protect her son. And I totally understand Mama Bear instincts, but I think I draw the line at attempting to murder me with an axe. The defense strategy was to focus on the lack of physical and forensic evidence as well as the local police department's lack of experience with murder cases. They felt that Chris was zeroed in on early in the investigation and that other possible suspects were not thoroughly investigated. One theory centered on Peter's uncle Frank Porco. He was a leader in a big crime family of New York City. Frank's mob name was the Fireman, since he had been in the New York Fire Department. It was suggested that the use of an axe in Peter's murder was symbolic because of Frank's nickname and the murder was in retaliation for Frank snitching on fellow mobsters for a more lenient prison sentence for his loan sharking and extortion crimes. This seemed unlikely, however, since Frank had children of his own who would have made more obvious targets for retribution killings. And another snag in this theory, Frank was in prison because he refused to give authorities any names, so this theory doesn't make sense. He never snitched on anyone. A grand jury was convened in November 2004 to hear testimony and present evidence against Chris Porco. After months of testimony and numerous delays, the jury indicted Chris in November of 2005. The trial began on June 27, 2006, and lasted 21 days. Chris's brother, Jonathan, was called to testify, and it was noted that he never looked at his brother. He described their relationship as strained. The jury began deliberations on the morning of August 10th, 2006, and returned that same day with a finding of guilty of second-degree murder of Peter and attempted murder of Joan. Chris was sentenced in December 2006 to 25 years to life on each count to be served consecutively. This would mean a minimum of 50 years in prison for Chris. Judge Jeffrey Berry stated that the reason for the lengthy sentence was, quote, I fear very much what happened in the early morning of November 15th is something that could happen again, unquote. Chris appealed his sentence to the highest court in New York, but it was upheld. The appeal was also sent to the U.S. Supreme Court, but they declined to hear the case. Currently, Chris has filed a motion for ineffective counsel, but the status of that motion is unknown. He is housed at the Clinton Correctional Facility in Dannemora, New York. Joan still continues to claim Chris's innocence and visits him frequently. If this case seems familiar, it's been the subject of lots of media attention. It was featured on Forensic Files as well as an episode of 48 Hours. Lifetime made a movie titled Romeo Killer, The Chris Porco Story which Chris filed a lawsuit to stop from airing. He was initially successful with that, but the film was eventually released. An episode of CSI New York was also loosely based on the case. Let me know what you think about this case. Is there any reason you think Chris could be innocent? All signs point to guilty for me. I want to read a recent message sent from listener Shane Flowers. Hi, Bobby. Love the podcast. First heard you on British Murders and fell in love with your voice, so I thought I'd give you a listen. It's now my favorite alongside Stu's podcast. The bloke that says your voice is annoying in season eight is a twat. Keep up the good work. P.S. I gave you five stars on Spotify. Cheers, Shane. I appreciate that, Shane. I was actually going to try and read this in a British accent, but it's pretty terrible and you might not like me anymore after that. <laughs> 
Follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and threads at Killer Stories Podcast. You can email me any story suggestions to Killer Stories Podcast at gmail.com. There's a link to shop Killer Stories merchandise that can be found in my link tree listed in the show notes. As always, thanks so much for listening. Until next time, this has been a Killer Story. <laughs>